Good morning. It's good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. It is a, is a privilege to bring God's word to you. It's, it's a matter of fear and trembling. One day, uh, we'll all have to give an account to the Lord for how we spend our life, but there is a special warning for those who are teachers of the word. So before we get to God's word this morning, we're going to pray for the Lord's help and that it would be him who speaks this morning and, and not me. So would you bow your heads with me? A gracious God, we thank you that in your mercy to us, we have the freedom to gather together this morning and, and worship your great name. Lord, these songs that we've sung, they're, they're full of truths that because of Christ, we, we share together. We experience these things. We hear your name and we are in awe. Lord, we look at your wondrous deeds and we're grateful. We look at the life you call us to live and say, Lord, we can't do it but through Christ alone. All we have is Christ. And Father, Lord, as we sing these songs, as we look at your word together, may you fill our hearts again with the wonder, the power of the gospel, and of the love you have for us. May it be you who speaks this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. We're going to be looking at James chapter 2 this morning. Uh, Kyle has been gracious enough to to share the pulpit with me. I don't think it's simply to give him rest. He's, he's also trying to give me opportunities. And to that end, uh, I'll just share with you a little bit uh, about myself. For those of you who I don't know, I'm Peter. My wife, Petra, was, was singing this morning. Um, we are seeking the Lord's direction in this season. We've been here for I, almost a year now. And as I look around, uh, more of you are familiar faces than not. I think a few months ago, I think a lot of you were still strangers. So thank you for the love that you've shared with us. We've uh, just enjoyed getting to know you all. And as I seek what the Lord would have for, for me, I'm seeking a vocational ministry opportunity, if, if that's what the Lord wills. So if you think of us, would you pray that, that God would be gracious, first and foremost, that uh, we would just continue to love him, wherever the Lord calls us, and... Uh, that he would be gracious to, to show us where he wants us and that he would give us peace. And uh, so we, we ask for your, for your prayers in, in that way. So again, let's, let's look at James chapter 2 this morning. The title of the sermon this morning is Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment. That's the last line of our text. But look at the first line with me. The opening line to our text reads, My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. I think it's fitting that the title of the sermon series we've been going through in James is Faith Changes Everything. We are reminded that this book, it was written by a pastor, a pastor in Jerusalem, to a group of Jews who were believers, but were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire because of the persecution for their faith. They had to flee because they believed in Jesus Christ, that he was the Messiah, and that he was the resurrected one. He's alive, that he's seated at the right hand of God. You see, this was a stumbling block to the Jews. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and an offense to the Gentiles. Most of the Jews rejected Jesus because he didn't come as they had expected. They were expecting a powerful man who would overtake the Roman Empire and restore the kingdom that their people had enjoyed under the reign of David and Solomon. They were waiting for the greater son of David, but they expected him to come in a suit of armor, not to come in a lowly manger. Jesus wasn't the one who fit their ideas of what the Messiah should be. And he didn't do what they expected him to do. They rejected him. The Romans didn't have much room for Jesus either. They worshipped man-made gods, including the emperor. The demand of faith in Jesus is an exclusive one, isn't it? 
Christ alone. And so, Jesus was a threat to Rome, simply because Jesus commands all of our loyalty. So this was an assault on the very basis of Roman citizenship and religion, devotion to Rome. And in this context is where we find the believers that are dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. Those who had converted out of these two groups, Judaism and, and the Roman Empire, those who had been converted out of these two groups into Christianity were viewed as outsiders at best and blaspheming enemies or a threat to society at worst. In the eyes of the world, they deserved ridicule, exile, or even death. And if they were thinking simply in worldly terms, this might have been perceived as a tragedy. All of this was because they followed Jesus. Faith does change everything, doesn't it? It changes our circumstances. But more than that, faith changes our relationship to God. If exile and death were the reward for faith in Christ, then why bother? It's because faith in Christ brings us to a new horizon that is beyond our wildest dreams. Friendship with God and citizenship in heaven. Praise be to him. It changes everything. It changes with where we find our joy, where we find wisdom, where we find blessing. No longer do we look to the world for these things. We look to our Father in heaven. As these people that James is writing to, these sojourners of the dispersion, looked around at their situation with no home, no friends, or a place in this world, I think it'd be easy for them to fall into discouragement and maybe even anger and despair. And so James, as we've been reading, what does he do? He reminds them to look up. Stop looking around at your circumstances. Look up to our Father, who graciously gives wisdom, blessing, and to those who persevere, the crown of life. James was reminding them that the trials they were experiencing were ultimately for their own good, for their sanctification, and their growing in maturity into Christ-likeness. And at the end of chapter 1, look with me at verses 26 and 27. James takes a step back from the specific directives for daily living, and he gives a general observation about living the Christian life. What does he say? If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You see here, James says there is a kind of religious living that is worthless a kind of religion that is stained by the world. But he asserts that there is a purer and undefiled kind of religious living that pleases the Father. So after telling them that they need to look up from their circumstances to the Father, he now tells them to look around again, to look at those around them, Verse 27 tells us that a person who lives according to a pure and undefiled religion takes care of the poor and the orphans. Pure religion is characterized by love for one's neighbor. We need to hear that word today. This message doesn't only apply to the dispersed Christians in the first century, the ones whom James was originally writing to. It applies to you and to me. In the passage that we have here before us, James goes deeper into what he means by a pure and undefiled religion. One that is unstained from the world around us. And he does this by giving us a counterfeit example. We're going to see that. And I'm just going to say, before we really get into our text, that this might be very convicting for us. Because... It may be the case that we are about to read an example of 
our own counterfeit religiosity. But as we come to our text, and we're going to read it now together, let it be a sobering reminder to us that what we are about to read may be confrontational to us this morning. I do want to take a moment here and pause and say, mercy triumphs over judgment. Christ, in Christ, there is more grace. So as you look at the text this morning and you say, this is me. Christ died for you. Your sins are forgiven. His mercy is more. And James will direct us to see this goodness, maybe in a subtle way, but he does direct us to see this goodness of our Lord, even in this rebuke. So let's read our text together. James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said... Do not commit adultery. Also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The word of the Lord. I wonder, does something strike you about the way James communicates his message? One thing that strikes me is just how much this sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. If you recall, James was actually the earthly brother of Jesus. And in many ways, James sounds like his brother. After reading this, you might be tempted to respond in a similar way to those who heard Jesus on the mountain. Matthew tells us that when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. I think what's so astonishing about James is just the clarity and the directness of his message. There is no beating around the bush with James. And the point is very clear here in our text. This is it. If you are a Christian, there is no tolerance for favoritism. None. Being partial is being sinful. If you were to stop at verse 1 of our text, you might be satisfied. <laughs> and reading the first chapter of James, you might expect him here in chapter 2 to, to move on quickly as he has in previous sections. This seems to be a very straightforward subject. It doesn't require a lot of words. Another thing about James is that he doesn't waste his ink. So here we go. There are 12 more verses to read. So we must reckon with these verses 2 through 13. Why does James give so much space to the subject of partiality? And I think it's because of this. Brothers and sisters, it's very easy to overlook this sin. It is a sin to show favor to one and not to another. This sin is particular. This sin in particular can slip under the radar. And 
it can do a lot of damage in the church. This is an important issue to deal with. And the argument that James puts forth here before us is kind of a movement of five parts. I have them up on the screen here. We're just going to work through these things together as we come upon them in sequence. Verse 1, we receive an instruction. This is the first movement. James gives us a principle. Look at verse 1 with me. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Again, here, here's the main point of the message this morning. If you, if you forget to listen to the rest of the sermon, well, here it is. Those who hold faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, they do not show favoritism. First, I want us to note how James is very pastoral in his instruction. Notice the familial language. We'll see this a couple times in our text. My brothers. This is already the fourth time that James has encouraged the believers with these words of brotherly unity in the faith. In chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers. In 1.16, do not be deceived. My beloved brothers, verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers. And again here in chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers, show no partiality. For those who have lost earthly family because of their faith in Christ, which would probably be the case for some of the people reading this for the first time in that context. For those who have lost earthly family, James is quick to remind us that we have so much more in the family of God. We are united by the faith. And this union that we share in Christ means that we are to care deeply for one another. We are to love one another. The family that we have been adopted into brings us under the care of a loving Heavenly Father who not only takes us in as sons and daughters, but co-heirs with His beloved Son. Not only this, but the family bond that you and I share brings with it a deep responsibility to each other. James shows us this responsibility by addressing the issue head on. He shows his care for the family of God and that he calls them out to repent and walk in obedience. Show no partiality. I think on the surface of it, we would all agree that being partial to one to the detriment of another, is wrong. But James wants us to know the basis for our obedience in being impartial. He says that we all hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Now, this isn't the direct reason that James is going to give for obeying the command. We'll get there as we progress through the passage But it's not insignificant that he ties these two things together. As you hold the faith, do not be partial. The implication here is that these two things are not congruent. They don't belong with one another. You cannot hold on to the one and commit the other. James is holding these two things up together and saying one of these things is not like the other. I also want us to notice how James adorns the name of Jesus, the object of our faith. He gives him a significant title in verse 1, the Lord of glory. The effect of what James is doing here brings significant weight to the subject he's about to discuss. If you thought this was a light matter of something that you just need to put away, well, just remember this. This is in the context of holding on to the faith of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory. As James says, wait a minute, let's stop and consider this. Brothers, show no partiality because you are all united in holding on to the faith in Jesus, our glorious Lord. Maybe you don't hear the effect of what he's saying, but just just listen to what this phrase might remind you of. 
This phrase brings to mind all of the times that God has manifested his glory in times past. Jesus is the Lord of glory. Think about the glory of the Lord that appeared to Moses and the people on Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. That was a terrifying experience. God's glory brought fire, thunder, and lightning. And this same glory, this is, this is the same glory that James is referring to in describing Jesus. He is the Lord of glory. So as James gives his instruction, so now he makes his, his message very clear, but to argue his point further, he gives us an illustration. So that's the second movement of the text. He gives us an illustration, starting in verse 2. What strikes me about the picture that James gives to us here is the timelessness of the situation. I could picture something like this happening in, in our church today. There isn't anything particularly bound to the culture of the first century in order to understand what's going on here. So what is the picture? Two men come into the assembly of the people of God. There is no indication that they are fellow Christians or whether they are people outside of the faith. We don't know. We don't know their spiritual condition. All we know is that one is clearly rich and the other is cl clearly isn't. One is arrayed in fine jewelry and fine attire and the other is covering himself with rags. We also don't know the reason for the distinction that is being made. Why would the believers pay attention to the rich man and treat the poor man with contempt? I think the point is that it doesn't matter what the official reason is, because no matter what it is, it isn't good. James is very direct with his charge. If you so treat one and mistreat another in your midst, look at verse 4 with me. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, that's the issue. There could be many different reasons or thoughts behind these actions. They are all evil. The illustration that James gives to us is simply that. It's an illustration. Based on what James goes on to say, we probably could conclude that things like this were actually happening in the assemblies that he was writing to. But again, it's so easy to, kind of, to see this kind of scenario happening today in our own midst to varying degrees. Whenever a new person walks through the door of this church, is it not tempting to make a quick and perhaps dismissive judgment based on their appearance, their state in life? Believer or unbeliever, any judgment based on outward appearance or worldly riches is an evil thought. And so the question is, why? Why is this an evil thought? Because it isn't as simple as saying that all judgments are evil. That simply cannot be the case because God himself is judge. He will judge all based on their righteous standing before him or the lack thereof. And yet, and yet, he does so impartially. He does so impartially. How is that the case? Well, again, that brings us to the next movement in his argument the inconsistency. You see, whatever the reasons for this judgment that's being made in this situation, again, we could speculate all you want. It, it could be that these believers thought they would gain something from a rich person if they treated him well. The poor person has no advantage to me. He can't give me anything, so I will give him nothing. This rich person, he might be able to set me up. I need to be friends with him. He's got connections. He knows people. He's doing well. I want a little bit of that action. What can I do for me? This is inconsistent with the character of God. Let's look at verse 5 together. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? 
Those are three very powerful rhetorical questions. They have a little bit of bite to them, don't they? The effect is this. It is clear that esteeming the rich and neglecting the poor is the exact opposite of what God would do. This is inconsistent with the very character of God. I think this harkens back to earlier verses in James. Look at chapter 1, verse 9 with me. What does he say? Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. The amazing work of the gospel is that God has called the people to himself in an impartial way. He brings both rich and poor, wise and simple, great and small, out of the kingdom of darkness and into the everlasting kingdom of light. In fact, the nature of his work brings about a grand reversal, doesn't it? Those who reject God and his gracious gift are often the ones who are most in love with the things of this world. What did Jesus say? It's more likely that a camel can travel through the eye of a needle than a rich man can enter into the kingdom. Why is that? It's because they're in love with the things of the world. And so, in the eyes of the world, the gospel is utter foolishness. But for us who are being saved, it is the wisdom of God. Indeed, God has chosen those who are poor, not only in the way that the world views the poor, all of those who are spiritually poor. Who is that? That's everybody. God has called the poor of this world to be rich in his, in his kingdom. So there is an inconsistency with the standard of God's character if you are partial. Christians who are partial towards those who they might see themselves as gaining from. So for these Christians who are doing this, though they may claim that they love God, they actually love the approval of the world more. Though they claim that they have treasure in heaven, they seek the riches of the world through favoritism towards the rich. Though they claim the mercy of God and receive honor from him, they have dishonored the poor man. Though they claim the name of the Lord Jesus, the Lord of glory, they esteem those who take his name in vain and blaspheme him. That is a serious charge. But James continues to establish his argument. And the next movement in his discourse is this, the indictment. Look at verse 8 with me. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Here's the judgment. This is the final piece to his argument. Why is partiality a sin? Because if you show partiality, you have broken the law of love, the royal law. Failure to be impartial is a failure to love. That's the argument. What is at stake here is the obedience to the second half of the greatest commandment. Jesus tells us, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is closely followed by a second, loving your neighbor as yourself. And I think that it's this section in particular that makes me think that James sounds a lot like Jesus. This sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. One of the things that James' audience might have still been struggling with was, what do we do with the law? Remember that these are Jewish believers, a lot of them. 
The dispersion of the 12 tribes is what we read in the beginning of this letter. So there would have been a Jewish heritage here. There also would have been Gentiles listening. Those who would have been enslaved by pagan idolatry. And who have been brought into freedom in Christ. We know that James himself was a part of the Jerusalem council. That agreed that the Gentiles are free from the law. And we also know that Paul in his other letters. Has clearly argued and rightly argued. That the Christian is free from the demands of the law. And yet, and yet, the law still has a part to play in the Christian life. It can be confusing. How do we reckon with this idea of being free from the law and yet still called to obey it? You see, the law is not bad. It is good. But in our own strength and in our own flesh, we we sung about it this morning. It's impossible for us to meet the demands of the law. We're we're condemned before God. James argues here that if you fail to keep one part of the law, then you're guilty of all of it. Look at verse 11 with me. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. The law in its entirety. On the one hand, this extreme example shows us that it would be very silly for, silly for a murderer to plead his case because he'd never committed adultery. So in this sense, being guilty in one part means you are guilty of all. But remember how we kind of thought that this sounds a lot like the Sermon on the Mount? If we recall the words of Christ, he took this command to not murder And to not commit adultery even further, didn't he? When he talked about this command on the mountain, he said to the people that if they hated their brother, if they cursed him in their hearts, they had actually committed murder in their heart. I don't think it's a stretch to see James having this in mind when he writes these words. Showing partiality is showing hatred to another. Showing partiality is committing murder in your heart. Have you ever had thoughts that were partial against another brother or sister? Against another person in this world, even if they haven't yet come to know the Lord Jesus? Brothers and sisters, we all have. This is the connection that James is making. Being partial is breaking the law of love. We are all guilty of breaking this commandment. Therefore, we are guilty of breaking the whole law. It is interesting here to see how James characterizes the law. Did you notice a couple things about how he describes it? What does he call it first? He calls it the royal law. The law of the king. Well, who is this king? It's no other than Jesus Christ, the king of kings. Look at how he characterizes the law in verse 12. We haven't gotten there yet, but just peek ahead. What does he call it? He calls it the law of liberty. What James is writing here about the law in the Christian life is informed by the gospel. It might not seem explicit in our text this morning, but it's there. The law of the king was not nullified or thrown away when he came. Jesus said that he came not to throw the law away, but to fulfill the law. The law was fulfilled by the king's sacrifice. By his sacrifice, the law that was once bondage to us has now become a law that is now to us freedom. And now, because we hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the King. We are still called to keep His royal law, the law of love. And that brings us to the final movement of James's argument, the implication. Let's look again at verse 12 and 13. James says, So speak and so act 
as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So how are we to treat those around us? We are to love those around us. Why? Well, brothers and sisters, it's because we are recipients of the wonderful mercy of God. We love God because he first loved us. That is the same reason why we love others too. James has come around full circle here. If you look at verse 1, he, he, he kind of restates his case in verse 12 and 13. Do not show partiality, brothers, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Spoken another way, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. The faith, the faith, that's the gospel. We're holding on to the good news. The good news that Jesus has fulfilled the law on our behalf. He has shown us mercy. He has not given us what we deserve. He has not given us eternal punishment in hell for our deeds and our thoughts that are evil. He has shown us mercy. Not only that, but he has united us to himself so that we may grow in Christ's likeness, learning to love one another just as Christ has loved us. This is the law of liberty. We are free. We are free indeed. Once we were enslaved to sin, and now we are slaves of righteousness. Once we were enslaved to sin, but through the freedom of Christ, we may offer our hands as slaves to righteousness. We have been saved for good works, that we should walk in them. But notice the warning that is here in verse 13. Look at it with me. Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. This might be the convicting part this morning. In many ways, our obedience to the law of love reveals what is truly in our hearts. Are we truly holding on to the faith this morning? Are we recipients of his mercy if I may call you brothers and sisters, it's because we share in the faith together. But if you're sitting here this morning and you, you don't yet know the Lord, maybe you've been living a counterfeit religiosity. Maybe you're depending on your works. Maybe you find this command to not be partial to another really difficult. Have you received the mercy of Christ? Have you truly repented of your sin? Are you still relying on your own ability to fulfill this law? You cannot do it. Christ has done it for you. Praise be to God. Fall on your knees. Confess your sins. Accept the free gift of his righteousness that is yours by faith that he has done it. Have you received mercy? In his wonderful grace to you, he will turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And you'll find that obeying this command is not hard. It might actually be what you want to do. We will see that if we are recipients of mercy, we too are to show mercy to others. We're not going to get into it this week, but as we continue to study in James, we're going to see James's argument is that faith without works is dead. He's teasing it even here now. But what is so glorious about the gospel is that Christ's mercy is greater than all our sin. Again, though we fall short of obedience to this law, we find mercy at the cross. When James says that if we are guilty of one part of the law, we are guilty of the whole, Again, the first thing that should come to our mind is our complete hopelessness in ever doing this in our own strength. In Christ, he cleanses us, forgives us, empowers us for holy living, bears with us when we fall, and forgives us when we confess our sin. Brothers and sisters, one day, we will be like him. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
So what is the implication of James's instruction for us this morning? The gospel affects how we view other people, doesn't it? I think this illustration that James gives to us speaks more close to home than we realize at first. You see, we can't look at people the same after encountering Christ. No longer do we regard them as the world does, but as Christ does. It doesn't matter where one comes from, what they do for a living, how much money they have in the bank, or in other words, how useful they they are to us in a worldly sense. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. How does Christ see them? He sees them as image bearers. The image of God. He sees them as lost, but as potentially found. His heart is for all who are lost in sin to come to him. And brothers and sisters, such were some of us. Such were all of us. The gospel is the great equalizer. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in Christ, praise be to him. Because of his cross work, because of his righteousness that he gives to us, there is neither slave nor free. In Christ, there is neither male nor female. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. In Christ, there is neither rich nor poor. As those who hold to the faith, all of us are co-heirs of the riches in Christ. If you want to remember all of the richness that we have, go back and read Ephesians 1 today. Do you share in that inheritance? Brothers and sisters, do you share his heart? In conclusion this morning, I just want to ask some practical questions. The message of James this morning is is very simple. We don't show partiality. One thing that I should make clear here as well, that just because we don't show partiality based on worldly standards, There is a standard by which we will be judged. Do you know Christ today? Judgment is coming for all of us. And we will be judged for how we walked on the earth. We will be judged for what we did with Christ. And how well we did and and what what he gave to us as a stewardship. How we treated one another. Our love for him and our love for others. So here are some practical questions for us. How do we view those who are new in our assembly? When there's a new person who walks through our doors, what goes through our minds? Do we view others through the lens of the world? Are we looking to what earthly gain we may have from them? Do we show contempt for those who do not meet our worldly standards? Here's a question. When do these temptations happen? Why do they happen? A better question that we need to ask if we are seeking to view others rightly is how does God see them? What would it look like to show them mercy? Those are just a few questions for you to think about. And as we close, let's ask the Lord for help. Would you pray with me? Our great Father in heaven, you are impartial. You do not consider all of the worldly things that we fuss about. Lord, there is one way to right relationship with you, and that is through Jesus Christ. And Father, as I'm thinking about this now, I just pray that you'd help us remember that the goal isn't for us to go out to the world in order to change these things. There are disparities in our world. There are rich and there are poor. Lord, our mandate is to make disciples, to show them that they can be rich in Christ. And so though there are things in this world that are not right, Lord, those are not things that we judge others by when they enter into our assembly. Help us not to be partial to others. Most of all, Father, as we 
seek to live in obedience to you, we look forward to the day when you will make all things right. Not only will there no longer be poor, all of us will be made perfect in the image of Christ. We look forward to that day. So would you help us now as we seek to live in obedience to you? Help us to love one another. Help us to love our neighbor, whether they know you or whether they have yet to come to know. Give us grace, we pray. Amen.